Oh boy, juiciest FF7 remake theory alert. This is gonna be the one. This is gonna really get you off. This is gonna be exactly what you need. You're gonna need therapy after you've listened to this. <laughs> Hello, my Final Fantasy peasants. How you doing? So today I'm gonna to start talking about therapy. Yes, indeed, you're gonna need it. In fact, maybe we all need it. I mean, there is literally that saying that everyone could do with therapy. You know, not everyone has a defined mental illness, but everyone certainly has mental health. And while I am no professional on this topic, and a lot of this is gonna be shooting from the hip, which anyone with deeper knowledge, you can definitely help me expand on this idea in the comment section below, I'd really appreciate it. But to a degree, we all do have to have some form of therapy skills, therapists, not only for ourselves, but also for others. Now, when friends or family, they, they come to you with issues that you need to help them work through. And having the trait that is very important to a therapist to quietly observe with some degree of detachment distance, and then having the compassion fueled wisdom to try to help push that person towards progress or indeed yourself. And that often comes at a very fine tune of balancing. Now the balance between pushing the afflicted with just the right amount of firmness and accountability, but not too much that it overwhelms. What if I told you Ever Seven Remake indeed was using this exact theme, but it was taking it to a whole new cosmic, next level, stratospheric scale, planetary scale, literally. This is what today's theory will be proposing my puzzles. Unreliable narrator. I'm just gonna warn before we even start, this is gonna get real trippy and maybe quite hard to adapt your mind around exactly what I'm saying, but I'm sure if you love FF7 OG, then freaking hell, you do love trippy, so let's just dive into it. You know that Cloud in FF7 Original was an unreliable narrator. It was the crux of a huge part of the game that Cloud is having this alter ego, that he believes he was in Soldier, that he believes aspects of Zack's experience are in fact his, and he relates entire segments of the game to us in unreliable, outright, false ways at times. The Nibelheim flashback didn't happen the way that Cloud announced it to us. Tifa's keeping the secret. Sephiroth is manipulating, exploiting, and amplifying up the secret that Cloud doesn't have correct memories, and that essentially he's creating the false narrative as a defense mechanism of his broken personality. You know, Cloud has to believe that he was a soldier. He has to believe that he succeeded at his dream because uh, otherwise he was a failure. You no, know, the memories of him being too ashamed to even show his face at Nibelheim. No, because he didn't make Soldier, it's too much for him to bear. I mean, Cloud out and out tells us in OG FF7, you know, in the scene in the Northern Crater where he, he basically says he's never been good at doing Cloud, that everything to do with Cloud is a total failure, he can't handle it, and, and he outright rejects his real personality, his real being. So he was an unreliable narrator because he needed to be emotionally. Now in comes Aerith, and I've been saying it for the longest time, I've been comparing her to a, to a guru at times, like a spiritual guru, you know. She, she does, she teaches Cloud things about life and the nature of the planet, and you know, that it's a conscious thing, and the soul, and whatnot. But for today, I'm gonna put aside the, the, the guru comparison that I've often made, and let's just switch it to therapist. Like a therapist in the traditional therapizing <laughs> sense, that she was that role for Cloud in helping him to navigate his false narrative, essentially get him to a point where he was able to drop it, see who he really was, and accept it. You know, that, that's why in the Forgotten Forest one, the, the last thing she ever said to him was to work on himself. So there was definitely a presence of Aerith being essentially Cloud's therapist in OG, but now in FSM Remake, it is amped so high and to the next level that I believe it could be indicating to us where the future of this series is going. I'm just going to play you a few lines. Think about this as if Aerith is being a therapist, basically. Wait, you think someone's out to get you? Is that what you're all worked up about? Relax. No one's going to attack you. I promise. Want to say that to a florist? Better than lying. Okay. Then what'd you do with the flower I gave you? I, uh... You give it away? I did. Ooh, to who? Tell me. Don't recall. Hmm? What? Thought you didn't like lying. <sighs> Cloud, get it together. Come on. Hmm. 
Which ones do you think we should pick? Any of them. Oh, don't be like that. I know you have an eye for this kind of thing. She's someone special. It's not like that. Honestly, I'm much more worried about you. Quit acting like you know me. So, Cloud, you were a soldier first class, right? Really? What's weird about it? Just that you were the same rank. What's his name? I probably know him. There's all the hallmarks that she is doing all of this intentionally. Like, like even that little one at the end where you know, she says Zack's name and it gives Cloud a headache. And, and then she's right in his face as if she was like observing it. And I say that this could all be intentional because of course Aerith does have some of her memories back. Again, exactly how much and to what degree, how much is instinctual and how much is literally future Aerith. And all of that is up in the air, but regardless, I think it's certain that on some level, Aerith knows that this is her role to help Cloud overcome these things. Like, what if she said that Zack thing intentionally and was, yeah, that close because she was observing? That's part of what a therapist does. They throw difficult curveballs. They, they make the patient bring up memories to the surface, ones that can be painful, and they observe the patient's reaction. So I really think Aerith is doing that and that she knows that she's doing it. And I, I go to one of the strongest pieces of support for it. It was a live stream white chapter quote. Again, how much would be canonical? It, it is a canonical thing in the FF7 universe, whether it be in the remake, different question, but I personally think this gives the entire context to the point of the 7 remake. And it was when Aerith was in the live stream, she started meeting other souls and some of them who lingered because of regret and hatred, and she would help them to move past their issues. And in helping them do that, they would diffuse and essentially the soul would join Aerith's side. Yeah, there was like literally talk about her gaining souls in the live stream. It was at that point that quote, the woman had found a solution. However, more and more spirits steeped in spite appeared and it was too much for her to bear. Uh, she talks about how that spite is coming from Sephiroth and that quote, in order to reduce the hatred lingering in the live stream, she would have to remove the hatred flooding the real world. The woman wondered if Cloud could help her. <laughs> However, that might lead to Cloud getting hurt as well. The Cloud she knew had a very fragile heart. Boah. Man, when you couple that with the story saying that Aerith figured out Aer uh, Sephiroth's plan, how he was able to linger indefinitely on the planet, and that she wanted to go back to warn Cloud, but at a place and time he remembered her, this is all the stepping stones leading up to the remake. And, and just to let you know, this was written around the time concepts for the remake. Were it to happen, that, that's when these livestream chapters were being made. So there we go, we've got the premise that the fate of this game, the planet, is a battle between the emotional state of not just Cloud Strife, it's the emotional state of the planet itself. I mean, the, because the planet in this game is a living, breathing, conscious entity. Or almost see it as like a child, a scared, confused, hurt, betrayed child, because that is what it is. But we're jumping ahead, next chapter, headaches. <laughs> I mean, there's literally compilations of Cloud having headaches for nine minutes straight. But it is so significant, guys. When Cloud has a headache, what triggers it? It was all telling us something. There's so much in the remake in this that was so subtle, but it all had a point. And what's really strange about Cloud's headaches is it's kind of paradoxical in the sense that when we see Cloud having a headache, we think he's tripping out. He's having a mental breakdown, like a moment of mental confusion. Where it's actually the opposite. He's having a moment of mental clarity. Because look at every time Cloud has a headache is when something, no, no, sometimes Sephiroth is intentionally causing them. Again, doing an active moment of manipulation. But for the majority of them, it's when Cloud remembers something real about his past. You know, whether it's a spinning fan reminding him of him and Tifa at the well, or seeing Aerith's bow reminding him of the materia, and then you know, real things that happened in the future when Aerith left him. No, the future and the past come to Cloud in clear visions that we know happened. So that's pretty wild. And, and the thing with memory is, I mean, it works so many ways. I've literally made a list. Number one, they can be transferred. This is so clear to me now, looking back over the series. And uh, I think even the directors kind of hinted that the reason people can see the ghosts is who Aerith touched and then who Cloud touched in turn. And that doesn't necessarily happen straight away. Like probably the reason why Rufus could see the ghosts was after his fight with Cloud. 
it wasn't immediate. You know, they take an awful lot of time to show when people come into physical contact and no other moment is clearer than this one. And this is the second rule of memory. It can become tangible. When Sephiroth is on the bridge, first of all, only Cloud can see him and it's illusion Seth. In fact, the old main actually broke down in extensive detail all of the Sephiroth and all of the appearance of the plot ghost. Like, <laughs> here we go. Here's just, here's just some of the excerpts from it. This is what Square have made. You know that they have carefully thought about these scenes when they're making these kind of tables. They all mean something. And it specifically says, the reason why Sephiroth can be seen in the Black Cloak Men is due to the effects of hallucination shown by their Genova selves. But it seems that only Cloud could see Sephiroth at the beginning of the story. Same again with this the bridge scene, uh, standing facing towards the party from here on, due to the effects of Genova selves besides Cloud, the party is able to see Sephiroth. So this moment on the bridge and we see it, only Cloud sees him to start with and then Tifa touches Cloud's arm and suddenly see Sephiroth. What? And the rest of the group. Suddenly he is no longer Illusion Seth just in his mind. He crossed from Illusion Seth to actual tangible seeable by others. Real world Seth. This is a massive inclusion to what memory can do in this game. It can become physically tangible. And then the final rule, and I've shown this you know, with the plot ghosts, they're coming in um, and they remove some memories from Cloud. Uh, they can be erased and altered can linger on the planet, it can become a spirit seeped in hatred and despair that has to be diffused. We saw that with the whole train graveyard thing, but regardless, th those are the main memory points I wanted to bring up. And what I want to propose is that Cloud's headaches are to him what the ghosts are to the planet. They are the same, they mean the same thing. What are you talking about, Bez? Buckle up, baby. If Cloud's headaches are indeed a moment where he's starting to see the truth over the false narrative that his mind has built up, which I believe to be the case, then that explains so well why at the edge of creation after Sephiroth, who has essentially become the manipulator of the narrative of the FS7 remake, he grabs Cloud's hand to stop him from having the headache. And it does, it stops. There is no flashback, there is no seeing into the future or past or something that was real and Listen to what Sephiroth says. Careful now. That which lies ahead does not yet exist. That which lies ahead does not yet exist. This was just as Sephiroth had taken from the planet the ability to control destiny. So essentially Sephiroth has become the rewriter of the game's narrative and that if Cloud glimpses into that via the headache, well he will see something that Sephiroth doesn't want him to see because Sephiroth hasn't had time to rewrite the narrative yet. That which lies ahead does not yet exist. So that's what Sephiroth has essentially taken and how it interacts with Cloud because that's really what fate and destiny is. That is what the planet was doing. This is where the planet is no different to Cloud and that is why Aerith is also being therapist to the planet. Oh, oh. I mean, it is because the planet is using the ghosts, which are tormented souls, tormented souls in pain. And when it uses them, it causes those screams to happen. The same as Cloud having the headaches causes it pain. And it's sending out these, these ghosts to try to keep a certain narrative going, to keep the story happening. The same as OGFF7. Why is the planet doing that? Because it knows from OGFF7 it survived. The planet survived the events of the meteor and Holy and Livestream come. So that's why it wants the narrative to stay the same for its own survival. It is a defense mechanism, which is no different to Cloud creating the false narrative he makes for his defense mechanism. And the fact that the ghosts have to come in and intervene with Cloud remembering stuff, not remembering stuff, take stuff away, means that Cloud and the planet are one and the same. Cloud uncovering his false narrative is no different to the planet uncovering its false narrative. And Aerith has to work for both against Sephiroth, who is trying to manipulate, again, said narrative. Now, what's the proof of this? What's some crazy ass proof of this? Well, when I took this mindset and I went and I looked back. There are so many moments in this game where Aerith could easily have been speaking to the planet and not us in trying to convince the planet to stop controlling destiny. The same way that Aerith is trying to encourage Cloud to stop following this fake narrative of, of Zack being soldier and all that, but she obviously can't do it straight away. She has to do it slowly. And there's a lot of pushback from Cloud. I mean, let's go to when they, they first meet. It's like Aerith almost immediately starts her role assessing Cloud's 
personality and Cloud actually gets pissed off with it like like when Aerith says oh no you would just be grumpy and you wouldn't ask for help because you'd be too prideful like Cloud gets actively pissed because just like any therapist and, and patient sometimes if the therapist pushes too much the patient can feel invaded upon it can feel invasive it takes a lot of trust to allow someone into that kind of mind space and a huge one I would point to is the bedroom scene Think about this. Think about one of the things that a therapist has to do. They have to, first of all, strip away the person's fake narratives and kind of shine a light on them. But then they have to address the underlying root issue. The Shinra Electric Power Company isn't the real enemy. It started with them, sure. But I promise you, there's a much bigger threat. I just want to do everything in my power to help. All of you, and the planet, and the planet. Oh, Aerith was trying to tell the group what the underlying issue was. Again, therapist Aerith. But what comes next is even more curious because she says about the underlying thing to them and then... <laughs> Follow them, the yellow flowers. Mm. Follow the yellow flowers. now. Notice when Eva says that she trances out. I think the trancing sort of glazing of her eyes is the clearest indication, other than when she puts her hands together in prayer, that Aerith was speaking with the planet. I think we often forget that Aerith speaks with the planet. Planet reading. I think Aerith was saying it to the planet. Because one of the things that we could interpret the yellow and the purple flowers, if this theory holds any water, is that yellow could be the path of clarity and the true narrative versus the manipulated narrative that is associated with the purple. And I mean, again, that, that, that narrative even for Shinra, Shinra are creating the false narrative that Mako Energy isn't destroying the planet. Of course, Sephiroth is completely trying to become the, the writer of the fake script. I think Aerith said, follow the yellow flowers to the planet itself because she's trying to encourage the planet to drop this, I mean, what must be a massive, massive effort. Think about it, the planet's having to use its souls to send them in to try to re-alter. I mean, look how crazy it gets. Re-alter all of these little events, these little butterfly effects, to try to keep a, a pressurized narrative in place. But if it can drop that, and if Cloud can also drop that, of course, the, the fear for both the planet and for Cloud is if they've dropped these narratives, they will be hurt. They will be at risk. They'll become vulnerable. That's something that a therapist really has to work towards when trying to break someone's defense mechanisms down to essentially allow the course of things to run naturally and to move on. Oh, and if Aerith is doing that, uh, and, and just like Cloud was very resistant, I could see that the planet is also being resistant because of that yellow flower scene. Look at what happens. If this is indeed a suggestion of Aerith telling the planet to stop creating a, a destiny narrative, well then the flower afterwards, it, it sort of breaks apart and through it comes a ghost. What did that mean? What if that was essentially the planet rejecting what Aerith was saying? And just that little moment of it being rewritten where the, the flower actually fell apart. That was just like a visual image of the, of the planet rewriting something and the ghost showing it. The planet saying no. And maybe that is why Aerith fights with the decision so much about breaking destiny. Because let's not forget, she breaks it with Sephiroth. She does what Sephiroth wants. Why would Aerith break Destiny unless it's because the planet has to stop intentionally having hand in manipulating things because that is also hurting the planet. Though the planet thinks it is defending itself like Cloud thinks he's defending himself, it's actually hurting it and it's preventing both of them from seeing what the real underlying issue is. And that's what Aerith is there to try to show them and indeed show the planet. Again, I say at the end of OGFF7, a lot of directors thought humanity didn't survive, that the planet didn't keep humans around. Well, what if that is what Aerith is here to do? Again, heal Cloud so that he can help heal the planet so that the planet can actually recognize that the underlying issue isn't all humans. Not all humans are bad. It's the ones who have been manipulating the narrative or the purple association. So that is Shinra that has been leading humanity astray and Sephiroth. Not all humans. And that could be the resolution of the end of the remake. It would be freaking wild. And if we look now at this potentially being the case that the game is littered with all these false narratives, 
Does this not massively open up the potential for all the trippy aspects in FS7 Remake? I'll just list a few. So obviously the stamp bag changing. What if the stamp bag changing was because, again, after Destiny was dropped, the real version of events happened, not the false narrative. Zack being alive. Even the little things that happened, like the, the seventh heaven sign was damaged slightly different. When the ghosts dissolved over Midgar, the, the structural build of Midgar was slightly different. Is this because we're switching from, yeah, false to true narrative? I mean, it may be. That's what I also love is that while I'm theorizing this, there's so much doubt in my mind because of how much doubt there just is over the soil right now. And that's why I think it's brilliant that not only if they expanded the unreliable narrator aspect from cloud to the planet they've also turned us the audience into it think about it how much debate is going on about what actually happened what did that actually mean in the remake is jesse actually alive well i think she is well i don't think she is what happened to wedge did he get actually thrown out the window well it seems he did and, and how is big so uh, alive but now there's their headband and gloves on the table so are they really dead which i'll just quickly say someone pointed this out the Bigs, Wedge and Jesse items of clothing actually are positioned in a way that it spells out the kanji for hope. <laughs> hope! But yeah, when it comes to like those three and other characters and events in the story, like us the fans are now debating over what actually happened. And in some cases, me especially, others, we're creating like biased alternate versions of how the tale went down, which is essentially, truth be told, how we wanted the story to go down. Like <laughs> We are doing what Cloud and the, the planet are both doing, creating a preferential version of the story based on what we desire, because what is really happening in Cloud's story and the planet's story and the Seven remake to us, the audience, is unknown. And the unknown is scary. <laughs> Boundless, terrifying fucking freedom. I <laughs> Ever said it, ever said it, freedom is scary, but freedom is the only way to see with clarity. And that's why this entire weave of yellow flowers is there and why I think that Aerith is encouraging the planet to also follow it. And the planet is very scared to do so. I mean, even at the edge of creation, like that, that yellow shot behind Sephiroth, it was even the shape of a yellow flower. Like this is being indicated to us that this is something of a planetary scale. I feel like Square have been teasing this to us from the very start of for years now. I mean, this whole concept of making up a preferential version of story events in your mind, even the first time we saw the yellow flower in the original trailer, listen to what comes straight after. Perhaps it was no more than wishful thinking. <laughs> Maybe it was wishful thinking. Jesus, as the flowers were smushed. And that's why I think this theme is present and why it throws into question the reality reality of everything that happens in Final Fantasy VII Remake. But that's what I think Aerith's role has been in this first part and will be going forward in the remake, that she's sneakily therapizing the planet. And just going to a few other examples of where she could be in communication when she like puts her hands together. So of course there's the alleyway scene where we also see a, a flash of purple that makes Aerith run away. This is what a lot of people think is the moment, like, like the flashpoint, so to speak, when Aerith and Sephiroth were essentially transmitted back to do battle over the new outcome of the story. I even see like before we went up the pillar, you know, the ghost showed up and she asked to be let through. Asked to be let through, you know, same as what a therapist would do. They'll, they'll try to ask permission first to be allowed into the story, the, the mind story that the person is, is creating and for it to be unveiled to them. And, you know, after they then get to allowed to pass through, everything puts her hands together. What did she say to the planet at that point? She said something. And that's why, if this is true, if Aerith is indeed guiding the planet emotionally through the different stages of grief, fear, and denial, so that it can ultimately relinquish a survival mode story, recognize and directly address the real infecting root issues, <laughs> the real infection, so that it can ultimately heal and move on. I might be blowing smoke up my own theory's ass here, but I'm not shitting you. That makes Aerith an S-tier written character, even just conceptually. That is amazing. Regardless for execution, um, even though I'm confident that you know, Square Enix and Brianna White are doing an amazing job. But it all makes sense to me that this is what Aerith is, is doing in the game, that she's known she's had to do this for a long time. And I'd even say th that she's staying professional in her role. Think about it. What's one of the golden rules of therapy? Never date your therapist. 
That rule also applies for the guru pupil relationship because it's very easy in that kind of intimate, vulnerable, trusting relationship. You know, sometimes a relationship when an individual is telling another things they've never told anyone else, it can very easily be confused for love. In fact, I found this quote from uh, Jody who said, in psychoanalytical theory, there is a phenomenon called transference. The therapist becomes a blank screen onto which the patient projects some instant or feeling that began in childhood. It would not be a far reach for someone to look at my feelings for Jess and assume that in the context of our relationship as tutor and pupil, I am not in love, I'm just in transference. <laughs> you know, back in OGF7, Kate Sith said that Cloud and Air with stars were aligned, that they were kind of like destined to be together. I, I've never ever seen that as a romantic relationship, I'll be honest, this is what I've always seen it as this more transcendent, but just as personal, just as intimate, I mean, even more than a relationship. Like, it can be. A, a Google pupil's relationship can reach the kind of heights of, of unconditional love because of how intimate and trusting it, it, it can become. And that an individual who is bringing up emotional traumas and childhood memories, that it can be so easy to project it onto the therapist, which, of course, could then cause confusion and, and hurt, which is, in my mind, why Aerith said, not to fall in love because of course part of those feelings could also be coming from Zach but also just because I think that Aerith knows she has to help Cloud not cause him more mental confusion. Another really cool quote I saw from Michael Adzima was the role of the therapist is to reflect the being accepting self that was never allowed to be in the borderline. That self is what Aerith is trying to bring through in this scenario so, so in this version she, she's the hot but professional therapist. Uh, no, to make this simpler who would Sephiroth be? I <laughs> He'd definitely be, you know, the creepy uncle. You know, he only ever shows up on special occasions, but every time he does, he manages to traumatize you in some new way. <laughs> like, and then Aerith has to undo that. And a Shinra, in this example, they'd be the boss. Be to the planet what your typical work boss is to you. you know, someone who is demanding way too much of you day by day, which is slowly draining the life from your body. And who will win in this great battle for the mind of Cloud and the planet? Hot sexy therapist Aerith or creepy Uncle Seth? <laughs> the last thing I want to leave off on with this vid is this final date scene with Aerith. There's two other significant things that happened. Again, one of them being that Aerith crossed her hands and if she was speaking to the planet as was Cloud at this point, he really would make sense because what is it that the planet fears the most? It fears dying. That is why it's so desperate to prevent it, you know, using the whispers, but also the weapons like, and how catastrophic and how they can't discern between friend and foe. It's because the planet fears dying above all else. And Dirge of Cerberus spoke about, you know, the planet being, of course, destined to die. Sephiroth talked about it at the edge of creation. That is the fear of the planet. So when Aerith crossed her hand and she said, Everyone eventually dies. Then started talking about how moments matter, how ex experiences matter, and that, that whole really, really deep dank speech Aerith gave. How much of that could have been for Cloud's sake, but then how much of it could have been for the planets? The last part, and this is where it's going to get real trippy. I've been looking at how dreams are incorporated into this remake because there's so many places where the, the terminology of dreams are used. It is also at this exact scene with Aerith. It starts by Cloud asking how this is possible and Aerith says to Cloud, you tell me, you tell me how this is happening. Like the implication on that scene being that this really real looking space is again created by Cloud. I remind you of the bridge scene where Cloud's illusions became reality. And this is where I think it might not just be a case that Cloud is an unreliable narrator. I'm gonna take this one step further. <laughs> I'm throwing a grenade in on this. What if Cloud is an actual extension of the mind of the planet itself. What? What? I mean, think about it. We've already seen that the ghosts control Cloud's memories to such a meticulous degree that there is an interconnectedness. And really, yes, take a shot for every time I've said narrative in this video. <laughs> what a false narrative in the sense this remake really is, is it really is no different to a dream. You know, a dream can be really real. It can have real people, real events playing. The only difference is your mind is controlling the outcome of the dream based on your subconscious, based on whether that's your subconscious desire to be a hero or whether that's your insecurities and fears. Is. You determine the outcome, and this is where you know the FF10 link has always been there. You know, Najima wrote it in, they showed it off again in the museum that the link was present. 
I've always said I think it's more than just an Easter egg, and especially with the ghost uh, train graveyard seeming similar to the far plane, I think even the concept of Dream Zanakund is applicable to the remake. Think about it. Zanakund is a projection of individuals' dreams. What if the events of FS7 Remake are Cloud's dreams? I mean, even in OG, when Cloud hit his biggest trip out moment where he couldn't discern fact from fiction, he asked if this is all a dream, don't wake me up. Here's a couple clips I'll play a few of the remake using it. Is this a dream? Maybe. You tell me. Sleep and dream the sweetest dreams. The voice of Sephiroth telling Cloud to dream the sweetest of dreams when he's trying to change the narrative of the game. Is this what Cloud's ability is? Is this the strength that Sephiroth wants Cloud to lend him? Is this why Chadley found within Cloud's strife supposedly infinite potential? Specifically Cloud, is that infinite potential that Cloud can essentially dream reality? Which in that case we have to question everything in the remake again, including did, is the reason why Stamp changed from, you know, a dog that had qualities of Zack. You know, it was a black dog and it carried an injured white dog and loads of other references to Zack that was going on with it. Well, was Cloud just projecting Zack onto Stamp and Stamp was always this dog and never the one closer resembling to Zack? Just how much of everything we see in FF7 Remake is from Cloud's mind. And we just don't know it. And what, what could be the sense for this? Well, as much as Cloud is called a failure, he is actually the most successful Genova project. He is. He's the strongest. He's the most powerful. He is the only one who actually makes the reunion. And what is Genova? Well, as per her name in FF7 Remake, Genova dream weaver uh, square have already made that connection with this topic being associated with dreams in the naming of genova dream weaver what if it's cloud dream weaver fuck i'm done i'm out <laughs> you guys get it let me know what you think in the comment section below for real shuffle back over some of your favorite scenes from the seven remake with this context in your mind i'm telling you man you can never see the game again the same way thanks a lot for watching guys comment like and subscribe Please, if you don't, I'll appear in your dreams tonight and torment you. Until the next video. Koopo!